Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is the Angry Day Podcast. My name is Dave, and my next guest is my friend Stevie Bananas. Steve, please say your name. Stevie Bananas? (laughs) Steve, tell everybody how we know each other. Oh, boy. Dave and I met walking to Stella Maris back in early 80s. Yeah. Long time. And for anybody that might not know, Stella Maris is a uh, Catholic grade school in South Philadelphia in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. But we became better friends, I guess, when we started playing football together when we were like 13 or 14 years old. That's correct. Capitola. And then we were sort of inseparable for a few years there. And then you graduated high school and went to do some stuff, which we'll probably get into. And I was still hanging on the corner at 17. And then I went away to college. And then we hooked back up. I think it was around a year or two. Yeah. But we start really becoming friends again when we start playing baseball together. Oh, well, yeah. We really started hanging out. Uh, I guess it was early 2000s. Yeah. We were 27, 28 years old. We're, Steve is uh, a little bit older than me. So before we get into your story, Steve, you have any angry dave stories you want to share with everybody uh yeah where do i begin there's uh many how about <laughs> one <laughs> off the top of my head yeah okay we're playing ball we had an interesting guy on our team His name was john we'll, we'll leave it at that it's in the middle of the game and you know we're getting beat as usual <laughs> i'm pitching dave's dave's at short and anyway, john's playing second base it's a routine pop-up Hit right, right just beyond second base. Man on first base. There's one out. Routine pop up. Dave says, I got it, I got it, I got it. And the guy, John, is right on top of Dave for, for whatever reason. And when I say on top, literally on top, within a foot. Yeah. So Dave catches the ball. He sees that the guy's leaning on first base. And uh, he goes to throw to first base. And he can't because Johnny's right there in his face. <laughs> if I throw the ball, I r- destroy his face. Literally, yeah. yeah. And he jumped up in the air and said, move, dude. And he just, the guy, John, just looked at him like, what did I do wrong? And we all just lost our shit. It was, it was hysterical. Yeah. I, I jumped up and down like a, like a five-year-old child. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a pretty tame one. There's one more I'd like to share. Oh, Jesus. Go ahead. Similar situation. It was baseball again. And uh, there was a call, a controversial call with the umpires in the Senate. They couldn't figure it out, and it took a really, really long time, and it was unnecessary. And, you know, Angry Dave, instead of screaming and yelling this time, he acted out by doing snow angels in the middle of the outfield. He literally ran from shortstop to shallow outfield and laid down on the grass and did snow angels. And both teams lost it, and it was hysterical. That's a grass angel? That is a grass angel, technically. Yeah. I'm going to go to the patent office and patent the grass angel. I did develop that. And, you know, it was one of the ways I tried to uh, calm down my anger. So let's start with you, buddy. You are born in August of 1975, correct? That's correct. In South Philadelphia? Correct. Methodist Hospital. Rodham Wolf. What were things like back then? Mom and dad are together, right? To be honest, I don't remember my mother and father together. They divorced when I was really young. They divorced in 1980. I was only five. It was me and my sister, Jamie. And she is how many years younger than you? Four. What was it like growing up at the time? Give me your first memory. Uh, growing up in South Philly, we lived on Bueller Street. My mother, her parents were a big part of my life. My grandparents, Jimmy and Betty, they lived across the street from us, which in South Philly is pretty normal. They were a big influence on our life, like I said, and uh, they helped us out a lot in the beginning because my mother was a young mother. She had me when she was 17. Yeah. And what were those days like? What do you really remember about like early childhood? Anything? Uh, Early childhood, we would go down. We would go with my grandparents down there. uh, I wouldn't call it a shore home. It was like a piece of property that he bought and he, you know, he built his own land and, uh, you know, it was, you know, 10 acres. It was. And we loved going down there. We loved spending time with them. And, you know, like I said, my mom was a young mother. 
And she, and she's also a single mother because at this time, you know, my father wasn't around much when we were younger. Every weekend, we pretty much go down with them. And there's a lot of memories. I mean, there's so many. We were happy, me and my sister. No matter what, we had each other, you know, and that's all that really mattered. Yeah. Any takeaways from that time and in, in your life and how, how it shaped you? I could have used the father figure back then, but at, at the same time, my grandfather kind of substituted that, you know. Yeah. But I, you know. Would have rather had my father there, but, you know, he. Dad wasn't around early on, starting a new family on his own. That's correct, yeah. Tell us about, what is your favorite memory from that early time? Favorite memory, okay. Christmas time, when we were younger. Yeah. So Christmas time was great. We, we really loved it. Like I said, my mom and pop pop lived across the street. So at Christmas time, we had what we had, you know, in South Philly called an open house. My grandmother would have people in and out all day on Christmas Eve. We couldn't wait to go across the street to open Graham's presents because Graham always had a pretty cool present for Jamie and Steve on Christmas Eve. And we would wait till midnight to do it. And it was, you know, as your young kid, it's a struggle to stay up till midnight. But we looked forward to that. And, you know, we met all of Graham and Pop's friends. We met my mother's friends. My mom would come over, of course, my Uncle Jim. That happened every year until we were around 12 years old. And that. It may seem simple to some people, but those little things like that, I really enjoyed, Yeah, you know, because we were all together right? and that's all I wanted, you know, and the only missing piece would have been my dad, right. but you know, my dad had his own thing. And then as we get older, you know, when I got into being 12 years old and being able to walk the streets of South Philly by myself, 13 to 14, I used to walk to my dad's house and pretty much do the same thing. And it, it felt good. And, you know, and I... My father went and had two more kids, Christopher and Ashley, with Lisa. And um, Christopher and Ashley are significantly younger than me and Jamie. Christopher is uh, nine years younger than me, and Ashley is 10 years younger than me. So it was kind of cool as I was a teenager, them kind of being a toddler and watching them grow up. It was, it was neat. What, what was Steve like as like a 10-year-old? How are you? Oh, man, I was a little asshole. <laughs> 10 years old, you know, I thought I knew everything. And it only got worse when I got into my teenager years. I used to, uh, the one thing I regret, I used to pick on my sister a lot. And I mean, a real lot, where the, the neighbors would call my mother at work, say, hey, Steve and Jamie are fighting again, because it was so loud. And Jamie would cry. Uh, one time I locked her out on the porch when it was snowing outside, just to be a little dickhead. I regret that now, but now, today... My sister and I's relationship is remarkable. Yeah, it's great. She has forgiven you, I guess. I would hope so. <laughs> so tell me about like, moving into your teenage years. What was Stevie Bananas like as a teenager? I know what he was like, but I want you to tell it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was a punk, man. I mean, looking back then, you know, 13, 14, especially when you and I were hanging around together, you know, hang around the kids on... Marshall and Shunk, Sheridan and Shunk. You know, some of those kids, you know, they got into some shit. Yeah. I'm surprised you and I actually turned out really well, man. I'm pretty proud of you and myself. It could have went a whole other way, you know? Yeah, we were pretty close to it most of the time, but we kind of stayed on the periphery, I think. We were good at towing that line. I don't know if that was smartness or just luck. I don't, I'm not sure. I think it was a little bit of both. Yeah. And at that time... We, we both had our fathers in our lives. Yeah. And also, I had my grandfather in my life back right. then. Me too. Yeah. So, you know, you got four male figures like, hey, you get into trouble, you're going to have to deal with us. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't want to deal with that. So, in my podcast, I tell a story about getting arrested. You have any uh, insight on that story? Yeah. I heard the first podcast and the reference being arrested that, and I will never, ever, I was a part of that. And I will never, ever forget the look on your mother's face. So just for the record, we actually were not doing anything wrong that day. We were not. We, we were not doing anything wrong. You and I walked to the convenience store with another guy, Chris. Yeah. I don't remember who else was with me. I think it was John. Yeah, I'm not sure else who was with us either. Do you remember being in court? You remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was your, what was your impression? Of court then? It, yeah. It was a joke. It was a, just to scare us. Yeah. Because they literally made us apologize to the officer and the judge. Yeah. And the judge had to look on her face as, you're wasting my time. 
Yeah, right. Do you remember me cursing the cops out of? I remember you. I don't remember you cursing them, but I do remember you saying something to them. I didn't hear you. Yeah, I said it under my breath. Right. And then there is another story that I tell about uh, me falling on my face with some girls. Oh, yeah, I was there for that one, too. <laughs> that would be me. Yes. <laughs> Probably one of the funniest things I ever seen in my life. <laughs> I couldn't hold the laughter in. I, I'm sorry. I just had to do it because they were laughing, too. I believe it was Michelle and Rachel. Yeah. Tell from your from your side of the story. Well, I mean, we were 13, 14, whatever it was. And, you know, you know how you were at that age. You're trying to oppress girls. And our little boy loins were on fire. Yeah, they were. And, uh, you know, and they were, they were cute. And they were attracted to us. So we were trying to impress. And you just lost your footing. <laughs> <laughs> That's just... <laughs> Literally had fucking pebbles in my forehead. Oh, oh my god. god. And the curb was big too. Big curb. For you anyway. Yeah. Uh, that's a short joke. All right. So tell us a little bit more about what was going on in, in those teenage high school years. What were you doing? So uh, I went to St. John Newman High School, which is now gone. Really feel old when both your schools you went to are gone. It's, <laughs> it's weird. It was a whole new realm. Met a lot of new friends. Kids from the other side of the city, kids from the middle of the city, you know, made some new friends. I don't regret high school. It was fun. Played a little bit of baseball and football. I'm glad I went to an all boys Catholic high school because I believe that if I went to a co ed high school like GAMP, I might not have made it, not paid attention because all I wanted to do back then was get with chicks. <laughs> what were you like back then? I thought I was one of the best things that ever hit Earth. I was a little arrogant, something that I uh, wish I wasn't, because I was just another regular kid from South Philly. Um, I was a good kid. I wasn't real bad. I just hung around, you know, some, I don't want to say bad people, but... Directionless people. Probably. Yeah, they, yeah, some of them didn't have fathers, so they didn't have any male figures at home, and they got into some shit that they shouldn't have. Of course, I made bad decisions, but nothing mm -hmm. that got into any serious trouble. Yeah. So what's your favorite memory from that time? Any favorite memories? I guess graduation, graduating high school was big for me. Yeah. I never made it to college. Uh, I should have. I believe that my parents could have pushed harder for me to go to school, but they didn't. Yeah. They, I mean, of course they wanted me to go to college, but they didn't help me in any way. Like give that push. And at 17, you don't know what you're doing. Right. I had no idea what I wanted to do in life. And your parents were very young when they had you, correct? Very young. Mom was 17, father was 19. So they were pretty young at me being 17, in their 30s. Right. How about any crazy stories, crazy things that you remember just about being in high school, hanging around? I have a story and nobody else was involved. It was me and my family. We were down the place in uh, Jersey. And I was dating a girl named Lisa. She was a sweetheart. And she hung around me all the time. So she came down the place down the shore. I said, oh, Lisa, let's uh, go four-wheeling. My grandfather had two four-wheelers, and I used to tear it up down there. So she says, you know, I took her for a ride, you know, this and that. We were riding for about an hour. And she says, well, take me back because I have to go to the bathroom. Okay, I'll meet you back here. I'm going to go for a spin. So I went for a spin. And boy, I was ripping through the woods. Now, when you're ripping through the woods in a four-wheeler, you, you got to be, you, you can't go 80 miles an hour. You have to go, you know, 30. So, but like I was, arrogant, thought I was the shit, ripping through the woods. I hit a tree stump. And I broke the rear axle on the, four, on the quad. And I flew probably about 10 feet. Jesus. And stupid me is trying to fix it. Now... In the meantime, I don't realize how long time went by, but about three hours went by. And my grandfather came looking for me oh boy. with a gun and his two other friends because he thought something seriously happened. So he finally finds me in the woods because I hear him calling my name. Of course, I shout out and he gets there and he looks at me and he just says, get the hell out of here because I'm going to shoot you if you stay. Well, it was probably the one of the worst decisions I tried to make and that was pretty embarrassing. I mean it may not sound bad to other people, but at that time in my life it was uh uncomfortable. Yeah. Tell me about what was home life like during your teenage years. Well my mother had 
two jobs. She's a single mom. Shout out to my mom, Debbie. She's yes. she's a good woman. She's a little crazy, but I love her. She's my mom, and maybe I'll tell my Debbie story <laughs> soon. But go ahead. Yeah, that's interesting too. <laughs> but she loves you. She does. I know she does. She uh she worked hard, man. She it was hard raising two kids. I mean, of course, she had a little bit of help from her parents, but her parents didn't help her with everything. Her parents were tough. My grandparents were tough. They made my mother earn everything. You know, and they were old school. She would come home, and some days she would work late and. The number one thing she was worried about, did my kids eat dinner? I have to get them dinner. Or does, does Stephen and Jamie have clean clothes for school? Yeah. You know, and, and, and she was able to send both of us to Catholic school on her own. Now, that's one thing. I Let me be clear that my grandparents didn't help out with tuition. My mother paid it herself. So yeah. it was tough, you know? Yeah. You spent a lot of time at my house for a few years. Do you recall father telling you that he was going to claim on his taxes? Yes. <laughs> that is that is true, people. That did happen. Uh, David lived around the corner from us. I used to go over Dave's house almost every day, especially when we were playing football. Yeah. And I would sleep over there every weekend. And, you know, that went on for about three years. Yeah. So after the first year, Big Dave said to me, you're here so much, I'm going to start putting you as, as a dependent on my taxes. <laughs> and I, you know, I didn't know what the hell that was. I was... 13 years old, 14 years old. Right. My dad's an asshole. Right. Yeah. But it was, it was, and there's a lot of stories there too. We could be here all day if I get into that. Yeah. The, the pepperoni story was one of my favorites. Uh, t- tell that story. That's a great story. Go ahead. So one day, me, Dave, I think there was a couple other friends that were over. And Dave says, let's order a couple of pizzas. You know, we'll have a pizza party kind of thing. Big Dave, you know, orders the pizzas. And you all know, Dave loves his cured meats. Love cured meats. Loves cured meats. So, pizza's calm. Everybody gets a slice of pizza and this and that. And Dave's not eating the pizza. He's eating the pepperoni off the pizza <laughs> that was supposed to be for his father. Well, his father flipped his shit. Uh, I started cursing him left and right. You little son of a, you know. Yeah. No, this is a, this is a fucking... You're allowed to curse on this podcast. I know you're allowed to curse, but I'm I'm told by family members that I curse too much, nah. so I'm trying to control it a little bit. Nah, fuck them. I love them, but fuck them. Anyway, uh, yeah. So then, my father, either eat it or don't eat it. Stop dealing the fucking pepperoni. Yep. And Dave said, "But Dad, I love pepperoni." <laughs> what else do you say to that to to your son? And he kind of looked at him like, "Oh shit, I'm beat." Steve, do you remember the football story when he was trying to wake me up? Remember? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, you just, yeah. So we, Capitol Cowboys played weight football, and, you know, we all slept over the night before. It just so happened to be a championship game that next day. And uh, we're all up and ready. Me and the two other friends that were with us, and Big Dave was a coach. And Big Dave, you know, he was a good coach, real good. And we were good that year. Very good. And um, Dave comes down and says, Steve, Dave's not awake yet. I said, no. Did you try to wake him up? Yeah. He goes, well, I'm going to try to wake him up. Okay. So he grabbed like a little piece of tissue. He was kind of, you know, putting it in his nose and this and that. Well, little Dave, I guess, didn't like it very much and went to go fake punch his dad, only the fake didn't happen. And he actually punched his father <laughs> in the face. No fucking jaw. Yes. So me and the two other friends, we ran out the door and little Dave ran up the steps because big Dave's face was going to pop. Yeah. He My- was going to explode. Um, I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. I ran up, and Steve can attest to this, but my, when my dad would get mad, his face would get burgundy. Like, it wouldn't just get, like, red or, like, flush. It would literally, like, every ounce of his blood went to his face. Yes, it looked like an overripe cherry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. um, Man, well, he got mad sometimes, too. But sometimes he got mad over dumb shit. I, you know, yeah. it didn't make any sense to us, but... In his mind, he, he was mad, you know? Yeah. Uh, I might take after him a little bit on that. Well, end. that's why I made that reference. Oh, fuck you, Steve. <laughs> All right, so you graduate high school in 1993, correct? That's correct, yes. What happens, Ed? What, what's your next step? What are you doing after that? Well, graduation happens, and a couple of months before that, I told my mom and dad that I wanted to take uh, a break from school. For you kids out there, that's the stupidest thing you could ever do. Don't ever take a break. Just get it all done. If you're going to go to college or a trade school or 
a school after that, do it immediately, consecutively. So I took a break in 93 and uh, just fucked around that whole summer. And, um, you know, before you know it, the year is over. And you're like, what are you doing? Uh, I worked at a, a bakery during junior and senior high school. Uh, most of you know it as Petito's Bakery. It was pretty cool. The guy who owned it, Carmen, he was a really nice man. He treated me very well. God rest his soul. At the end of the year, my mother again said, you know, you got to do something. Like, what do you want to do with your life? And I didn't know. I really didn't know. So then 1994 comes around. And again, you know, really didn't have any direction. And, you know, later that year, some big news happened. What big news? I got a girl pregnant. Um, um, um. Yeah, pretty interesting. You're still with that girl, correct? I am. Married 26 years. 20 this April. Six years. Jessica comes what year? September 1, 1994. And you have twins? Uh, not till later, 98. 98, right. Good. A few years later. How was, so how old were you when Jess was born? 19 years old. Tell us about being a teenage young, young parent. How was that struggle? Well, my whole life, my teenage life anyway, I promised myself that I didn't want to take after my parents and having kids young. Well, that went out the window. I got a girl pregnant at 19, and being a father at 19 puts things into perspective. I had to grow up immediately. And the number one priority for me when she was born was, I got to take care of this baby. And I have been since then. I still do, and she's 28. I will always take care of you know my girls. That's the most important thing to me. You had, so you're raising, the twins come four years later, you said? Yeah, March 98. 98. Three daughters. Yeah. <laughs> they're all they're all adults now. They're all adults. How is it raising three daughters? Hard. Hard. Probably just as hard as being a single parent trying to raise two kids. If not harder. Because you worry about them constantly. You are always want to know who they're hanging around with. You always want to know which boys try to take advantage. Because, let's face it, and I'm speaking from experience, <laughs> males will always try to take advantage. What, what was it like during those times? What, what was Steve like? What was life like? The hardest thing to do first was to tell my mom that I got a girl pregnant. Yeah. That's the first time I cried in my mother's lap. 19 years old, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And she said, don't worry, we'll work it out. And coming from my mom, I was surprised because I thought my mom was going to flip out. And the next step was to tell my father, which I was afraid. So what I did was I told my stepmother first. <laughs> and she said, you know, she was surprised. And she said, don't worry, we'll work it out. And we'll tell him together. And I said, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Shout out to Lisa. Thank you for that. Lisa's cool. So... I don't know if it was a couple of days later. It, it wasn't too long after that. We I told him in a Kmart, Dave. <laughs> I okay. told him I told him in a public place so he couldn't freak out. Yeah, and he handled it a lot better than I thought he was going to handle it. What did he, he say to you? He didn't say anything. He just stared at me. <laughs> I know that stare, Steve. Yeah. He said, "I can't believe that you're doing the same thing I did." Yeah. Right. And I told him, I said, well, it wasn't planned. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, Newsflash, it wasn't planned. Yeah. Like, I didn't plan on this happen. It just happened. Right. Tell us about just how you were and how life was during that early time with the, the three girls. Well, I mean, when Jessica was born, you know, Jen and I were not together. You know, it was a little rough in the beginning. Her father wanted to stick a shotgun up my ass and pull the trigger. He did not like me at all. Her, her father had just recently passed uh, now. But back then, he was a strong man, tired Navy. He was a uh, mechanical engineer, and he was a tough guy because I met him a couple of times before that. Right. And I was afraid to go around him again because <laughs> he called me a South Philly punk. <laughs> I was going to prove to him that I was going to help raise Jessica 
and do the best I can and be responsible. And in the beginning, it was rough, like I said, but eventually Jen and I came to an agreement that, hey, I can, ha I can have her every other weekend, you know, and pay child support and all that. We never went to court, ever. That was great. Be and that's, that's a plus, man, because if it's, when you go to court, it gets ugly. We were fortunate enough not to go to court. You, you guys eventually got back together. We did. Right after the holidays that year, I, asked, I kept asking her to dinner, and she kept telling me no. And then I said, how about lunch? And she told me no for another two months or whatever. <laughs> and then finally gave in, and she said, okay, lunch, and that's it. And we've been together ever since. And then the twins come around the four years later. Yep. You got three little girls at home. How, how's raising them at that point? Like, what, what's life like? Well, when the, when the twins were born, uh, the twins had twin twin transfusions. So the twins were very sick when they were born. So now you got a couple of 20 uh, something year olds who are trying to raise three kids, two of which are really sick. Twins were in the hospital from March 10th, the day they were born, to July 24th. And it was, it was bad. It was uh, something I do not wish on anyone. You know, you have to go to the hospital every day. Wondering if your twins are going to make that day, make it through. One of the twins uh, were on a ventilator for th almost three months. The other twin was on the ventilator for one month. And they were one pound, five ounces, and two pounds when they were born. They were born 27 weeks. It, it, was, it was rough. And um, having a three-year-old at the same time, Jessica, she was actually great because she helped out a lot. Tell everybody about that call you got from an insurance company. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot about that. Thanks for bringing that up. So with the girls being in the hospital, and I had good insurance back then. We, we will not name the insurance company because I don't want any lawsuits brought on us. Because <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if they came after us. Anyway, we got a call from the insurance company probably about the third month of the twins being in the hospital. Saying that we have a one million dollar policy. If you hit a one million dollar, if you hit one million dollars inside of a year, we're going to drop you no matter what. <laughs> and at the time, you know, I I, I was kind of like angry, Dave. I wasn't putting up with any shit, so I just blasted the lady over the phone because, you know, obviously the insurance was pretty high. It was over nine hundred thousand dollars for coverage. I did pay thirty thousand of it back. Unbelievable. Uh, and the insurance company told me. We appreciate you even trying because most people don't even try. Yeah. So they forgave the rest, which was a miracle because she got out the chop. They saved my girls' lives and Crozier. Tell us about your work life at the time or, you know, like with the kids growing up. What, what were you doing? I call you Stevie Bananas. Why do I call you that? Well, when I, when I first found out that Jen was pregnant with Jessica, my father brought me down to the food center down the Philadelphia Pre uh, Regional Produce Market. And you know a lot of people down there. And they put me to work right away. Put me to work. I was making good money. When the girls were sick, the twins, a couple of years later, I was on night work. And it was tough, you know, working from 6 p.m. to 4 in the morning. It was hard, especially being in your 20s, man. You don't want to work nighttime. Right. But at the same time, in my head, wow, I'm making more money than most of my friends, which I was. And I was on nighttime for a while, and it was hard because Jen was working in the daytime, so I would have to come home, sleep for an hour or two. Jen would go to work, and then I would have to watch Jessica. And then after Jen got done, her mother would help us out. Her mother would come over so Jen and I can go to the hospital to see the twins, you know, or my mother, or even my grandmother. My grandmother helped us out a lot, too. So what's been going on the last 10 years with your life? Like, bring us up to date. Of where you are now. I know I'm not that interesting. It's just. <laughs> it's more interesting than you think, buddy. Yeah. It's it's relatable. People right. people have a similar life to you. People want to hear your stories, how, how you uh, progressed. I think it's great. I think you underestimate the power yeah. of your of your story. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, um, so fucking answer my fucking question right. and stop being a last pussy. Last 10 years. So I've been uh, running a small company now for 13 years now, and his name, well, his name is John. I'm not going to say the name of the company. He, he's a wonderful guy. 
He's given me a great opportunity. Things are going really well. Do I work hard? Of course I do. You know, with any hard work, it pays off. Things are starting to look really good in the last five years. So even even COVID, even during COVID, we managed to get through it. It was a grind, but we got through it. So tell tell people what type of company it is. It's a wholesale produce company. Um, we take care of a lot of country clubs, hotels, some restaurants. It's we, we, we do we do well. We got a nice little company. How much is a case of lettuce? Right now it's pretty cheap. My cost is twenty four dollars. Case of bananas? Bananas are actually high. Twenty one. How about uh passion fruit? I have no idea. I haven't bought it in a while. Fuck. I know my friends and family don't pay for produce. How about uh, the oranges that you brought for me? They costed they cost nothing for you. I'll need a favor later. <laughs> you know what I do need? I need one of those buckets of pickles that you used to get me. Like yeah. the, the spicy ones. Yeah, people love those. Fucking awesome. <laughs> Let's talk about managing people. or And just your work and work life in general. What's your favorite part about your job? My favorite part about the job, quite honestly, is when, and this, this doesn't happen often, happens very, very, very seldom, is when a customer calls you and says, Thanks, Steve. Everything was awesome. You guys really do a good job. The stuff that I buy from you on a Monday lasts until the following Monday. Because most companies out there, not most, I shouldn't say that, but there's a few out there that are extremely cheaper, but their stuff only lasts a day or two. And some people complain all the time. and I don't want to hear about that. And the most, you hear a lot of complaints from people. You'll hear them often, if there is any. But luckily, fortunately for us, we don't get many returns, thank God, not on wood. So we do our job, and that's what I like about our company. We do our job, and we do it well. How about the worst thing about uh, your job? What's the worst thing about our job is collecting money from customers. It's, you know, people want to pay you in 90 days, and it's just ridiculous. I say, to, well, you pay your mortgage in 90 days? Because <laughs> that would be a problem. You know, and they say, oh, well, I, I, you know, or if someone owes you $10,000 and they want to send you a check for 100 bucks. I mean, it, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, chasing money. Chasing money's tough. You know this, but I helped run baseball teams and baseball leagues for a long period of time, and that was 100% the worst part about doing it. We would even raise money and make it cheap for people, and you'd still have to fucking chase them down and beg them for money, and it drove me insane, and I don't have the personality to deal with, <laughs> deal with it's that. It's unbelievable. It's it's particularly hard to chase money yeah. from people you know yeah because they oh well you're a friend you know me right nah, they, that's bullshit yeah they try to take advantage of that friendship yeah 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 well you know it's like sonny said in the bronx tale you know it costs you 20 bucks to find out what kind of guy you have you don't ever have to see him again give me your opinion on the young worker the young worker young worker opinion now today's world Today's world, Steve. Nobody, uh, nobody wants to work hard anymore. They, they want to come in and they expect to make a hundred thousand dollars right up front. And you know it doesn't work that way. I don't care what kind of college education you have, you know, because people want to see experience. They want to be sure that you know what you're doing before they make that investment. So right. you can't, and that, and that goes. I, I believe that goes with any profession. I mean, anybody can come down my work and do the starting level job. They can, but the same time you got to show them what you can do before they invest in you because that's what it is companies employers they want to they want to invest in something but they want to make sure they're getting a return on their investment and if you start missing one day a week or you're late or you're just doing the least amount of work you can do not to get fired that's why you're not making a hundred thousand dollars a year because they may not say anything but they see it so when you think, oh, I'll, I'll, if my job starts at 9 a.m. and I get done at 5 and you show up 5 of 9 and you punch out at 5 p.m. and you do very little work during the day, they're going to see that and see that. If they see someone coming in at quarter to 9, that's when you go get your coffee and you go to the bathroom. You don't punch in at 9 o'clock or punch in at 8 o'clock or whatever, then go get your coffee and go to the bathroom. And do your things you need to. You do all that on your own time. You don't do that on the employer's time. 
And that's why, and that's what I tried to explain to my daughters. Because my, my daughter, Jessica, she went to college. She went to Temple. Great school. Shout out to Temple. Shout out. Got her degree in marketing, directing. She struggled in the beginning. She lost her job during the pandemic. I was able to help her out by getting her a job at the market. And she worked for a big company. And they appreciated her and they loved her. She did a really good job. And then she decided to leave because she put her resume out there. And now she works for a medical company. And she is the marketing director and has gotten recently a $20,000 raise. Awesome. She's a good kid. Well, she's a grown woman now, but I still call her my kid. Yeah. I have to work on that at work, by the way. I often say things like, yeah, that girl. And uh, yeah, that's not good. They're women. Call them young women. They appreciate it. Yeah. So, well, they're women, and I should respect that. <laughs> hey, one more thing before we get off that subject. Yeah, to man. The, to the young people out there that want to succeed. Money's not everything. It's not the key to happiness. I've learned that too, because I have made money over the years. And there were times where I was unhappy as hell. I remember that time, Steve. Very yeah, I would, I would often, I would frequently freak out on Dave over dumb shit. And it was just, it yeah. wasn't worth it. Yeah. 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 It was fucking miserable, Steve. It was, it was, yeah, that was miserable. You're angry, Dave, on miserable Steve. It was fucking miserable fuck for a, a solid two years. Yeah, it was, it was about two years. Yeah, you're right. It was, it was bad. So let's talk about moving into the future. What's on the horizon? What's your plan for the next five or 10 years? Where do you want to be? What do you want to do? Believe it or not, I actually do have a plan. Shocking. Yeah, right? Shocking. Just go with the flow. So what I want to do is I'm going to take over this company eventually, which is good for me. Yeah. The money is going to be wonderful. Yes. But it isn't the money that's going to make me happy. It's all the hard work that I put in over the years is going to make me happy. And what I want to do is invest in some real estate down ashore, as you know, and I want to be able to leave something to my girls. I want to make sure that they have a good future. And they, the, the ultimate goal is you want your children to do better than you. And I think Jessica is doing better than me already. She just got a raise at her job. She's so smart. She's doing a great thing and she's getting married next year. Yeah. Loves the guy. Uh, the guy John, he's he's a great kid, man. He's another one. He's not a kid, but he's 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 a good guy. He's not a boy, Steve. He's a man. And like I said, you know, for me, as long as my daughters are happy, nothing else matters. Nothing. Yeah. How about the twins? How are they doing? Twins are doing well. They're coming around. Kelsey is uh, moving in with her boyfriend for the first time. <laughs> it's uh, interesting. He's a man too, Steve. He is a man. He's a young man. He's a he's a good man. He's very quiet. He's humbling. He's a man with your daughter. I'm sorry. He's dude. a man with my daughter. But <laughs> my daughter's a young woman, David. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I had to fuck with you. <laughs> bad. Caitlin. Caitlin's autistic. If anyone doesn't know, she has Asperger's and she's on the spectrum. She'll be with us for a little bit, but I'm all right. I'm okay with that. As long as she's yeah. As long as she's with us and I know where she's at, you know, it's, yeah. you know, it's a, it's, it's a struggle, but she's a great kid though, right? They're all good girls. Oh, a Thank great God. woman. Sorry. I uh, have to give a lot. To, listen, I, I, you know, I take credit for it, but Jen was a good mom. Jen's a good wife. She's a good mom. And I'm very, very fortunate to where I am today because it could have went a whole lot worse. So my favorite part about Jen is that she laughs at my jokes. Yes. She loves you. And she laughs particularly at my jokes when I make fun of you. Yes, she loves your humor. She thinks you're funny. Um, but she'll never tell you that. No, I know. It's okay. But I know. I could see the smirk on her face. And that's <laughs> important to me. All right, let's talk about some advice. What advice do you have for 18-year-old Steve? Wear a condom. <laughs> yeah. Stop trying so hard. Explain that for me. Well, at 18, I was trying so hard to impress other people that I literally fell flat on my face and failed. If you just go with the flow, just, you know, do your best. It sounds kind of stupid. You say, stop trying so hard and do your best at the same time. But yeah, I think people are, most people are intelligent. They can figure it out. I hear you. 
the worrying about what other people think and the perception doesn't help you, right? That's, That's correct. correct. Worrying about the reaction of other people is never, you can only control what you can control in your life and, and making that effort. Right. So that's it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what other people think of you is none of your business. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter. You shouldn't worry about it. What advice do you have for young workers just in general? Well, it goes back to what I said a little bit earlier. Uh, You know, don't come in there cocky. Don't come in thinking you're the best and try to reinvent the wheel. Just work hard, do your job and be on time. And by on time, I don't mean if your job starts at nine, come in at nine. Try to get their quarter off. So whoever is in charge sees that. They go, oh, this guy's actually ready to work at nine. You know, not walking through the door at nine. Yeah. There's no replacement for putting your head down and doing the work. And doing it well and trying hard. There's no replacement for that. That's correct. And keep your opinions to yourself. You think someone's not doing what you they should be doing and you, you are not in charge of them, don't worry about it. You don't you don't pay them. You won't sign their checks. So don't worry about it. Yeah. And again, it's part of the perception stuff, right? It's part of do your job the best of your ability. And yes. Everything will fall into place. You don't need to worry about what other people are doing. It all gets figured out in the wash. Correct. People reveal themselves. Absolutely. How about any advice for the bosses of the world? What advices do you have? For a young boss or any boss, really. Don't talk down to people. Talk to them, not at them. Because they're human beings, too. And you don't know what other people are going through. You have no idea. You don't know if something happened at home with the man's wife. And he's he's not ready to tell you what happened. And you see something that it's not normal at work. Don't just freak out at him. Don't scream at people because that, that's just ridiculous. I mean, you're not going to get anywhere with that. Not in this town. No, <laughs> no. And that's the one thing I can honestly say. Like, I have supervision over a small amount of people. And listen, there are some things that drive me crazy that they do. But I know that they do it because it's not necessarily the wrong thing. It's just not my way. And just because it's not my way doesn't mean it's not the right thing either. Right. So. I don't say anything to them. I let them get it done. And, you know, hey, it, as long as they're getting the job done, you know, and yeah, give them that leeway to sure yeah. and let them make their own mistakes. Let them learn. People learn from mistakes. You make one mistake, it's a mistake. But if you make the same mistake, it becomes a problem. Right. That's when it becomes a problem, right? Not learning. Correct. Yeah. How about any advice for parents? What advice would you give a young parent? Be the best parent you can possibly be, no matter what no matter any kind of adversity that you face. And I know it sounds extremely difficult, but no matter what, you have a child that's looking up to you and they watch and learn everything that you do and say. You always try to do the right thing in any situation. What was your biggest struggle as a parent? What do you wish you were better at earlier? That's a great question. I know, I'm good at this. Here's the arrogant part. Some of the decisions that they made, uh, I did not like, and I wish that I could control them, you know, when they made those decisions. Not all the time, only when they made those decisions. Right. Like some of the... Yeah, you wish you could have got out in front of it, I guess? Yeah, like prevent it. You know, like, uh, I'll give you something stupid. Uh, Caitlin, with her piercings. Yeah. It drives me crazy. But she's she's an adult. She's, the woman. she's 24 years old. She can make her own decisions. Yes, she can. And she asked me how I look, and I told her you look ridiculous. But that's my opinion, and, you know, that's it. She didn't like it, but whatever. I mean, it is what it is. Can I give you some advice? Let that chick go. It's not important. Oh, I know. I know. I'm learning. I'm still learning. Yeah, we're all... You we're, learn every day. We're all a work in progress. All we'll work in progress. Your relationship with them is more important than an earring. Right. So let that shit go. It's hard. I want to punch my son in the face often with his hair choices. But I can honestly say I've never felt that. I've never wanted to hit my kids ever. Yeah. Well, as mad as they always made me, I never wanted to hit them. But then again, I don't have boys. If they were boys, yeah, I might have dropped one of them. 
Yeah, I mean, I haven't had many of those opportunities because my kids really are nice human beings. But every once in a while, I, I want to rip their ear off. And, you know, that's my problem. I mean, I get it. I have that's, a, that's called angry, Dave. Yeah, I have a rage problem. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've come close a couple times, but I'll never, I'll never touch my kid. I mean, I, it won't happen, but I've, I've come close where judo helps. It helps to be able to, <laughs> judo helps to be able to throw your 16 year old and not get in trouble for it. Yeah. Well, one day he's going to be bigger than you. It's getting be, closer. Yeah, I know. It's getting very close. I, I think be- between you and I and most of the people that we know who have children anyway, our children and our people that we hang with are, are good people. Yeah, man. You tend to surround yourself with good people. Yeah, birds of a feather, right? Yes. I mean, all right, let's talk about being your friend. What's it like being your friend? It's it's hard. <laughs> Why is it hard? So I can be a moody son of a bitch sometimes. Yeah, and take things out on you that you don't deserve. I know that. But I am as loyal as a puppy dog, and you know I would do anything for you. I think all of that's true. Your emotions. Have they been affected by being around a bunch of women your whole life? Absolutely. (laughs) You tend to get soft over the years. Believe it or not, I'm more soft now than I've ever been. I know you are. (laughs) I know you are. (laughs) Behind every man is a good woman. That is true. Uh, I'm just fucking with you, dude. That's all right, man. I'm, I'm... I own it. It's fine. I embrace it. How about being your dog? What's it like being your dog? Oh, my dog. Oh, my dog loved me. You mean the dog now or the dog that I just... I mean, all your dogs. They're my friends. They're my buddies. My my Vader was my buddy. He was the best. He was always near me. He felt loved. He always greeted me at the door when I came home from work. Yeah. And the other one now, she's just... She's a female, so she's moody. What's it like being in a relationship with you? What's it like being Jen, being your wife? Oh, God bless her. She's a saint. She's going straight to heaven. <laughs> it's tough. It's hard. Again, moody. Snapping out on her for dumb shit. Things that really don't, they're insignificant in life, you know? Yeah. But she knows that I'll always be by her side. She knows that I'm you know, a loving husband and I do love her. And she's probably... You know, after everything that we've been through, probably one of the, my most favorite people on this planet, other than my children. How about advice for young husbands? Any advice for them? Well, you know the song, Stand By Your Man? Stand by your, your woman. You know, be there when they need you. And I don't mean financially. I mean, like, believe it or not, emotionally. If a parent dies or somebody, one of their friends gets into some kind of trouble and it affects them, be there for them. And don't always say anything. Just listen. Don't tell them what you would do. They don't. They're not really interested in that. They they just want you to listen sometimes, and work work at it. Don't you know? Don't just give up. You you, you know you're married and you're young married and you're married only five years or whatever and it's, times are tough. Just try to work at it because you married her. That's the woman that you chose. Yeah, everything takes work. Absolutely, relationships are hard, man. I mean, you got to work at it. It ain't easy. If if it was easy, everybody would be married. Tell me about what would forty seven, what would eighteen year old Steve think about forty seven year old Steve? You'd become a big pussy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you've got really soft, old man. What's going on? Uh, You know, I. But he would also say, considering where you started, I'm pretty proud of you. You know, I didn't answer this one in my podcast, but for me, I don't even think that 18-year-old me could conceive of 47 or, yeah, almost 47-year-old me. Like, I just don't even think it was in the realm of possibility. So I think I would be very proud of myself, but I don't think I would recognize who I am. 100% would think I was a nerd. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Dork. But your your 18-year-old self would be very, very proud of you. Yeah, probably. Listen, man, you you know, you did some great things over the years. But again... Let's talk about how much you love me. We're, we're 18. <laughs> and 18, we were just little dickheads. So, yeah. Yeah. Just little dickheads with not having any idea what's out in the world. No idea. I thought I fucking knew everything. Me too, man. Me too. And, you know, like 18 years old, you think you know everything. You don't know shit. Tell me about the person or relationship that had the most impact in your life. Who's that person for you? For me, it was my grandfather. He he helped me out in a lot of ways, and you know, 
it's, it's I spent a lot of time with him growing up. No disrespect to my mother and my father. I love my par- I love my parents of very course. much. Of course, but there's always there's always that someone you need outside your parents. Yeah, and that was my pop. My pop was a man. He was at times when he needed to be a grandfather, he was a grandfather. At times when he needed to be a pop pop, he was a pop pop. And at times when he needed to be a friend, he was my friend. And we hung out a lot in my teenage years, in my early teenage years. And even when I became adult, we hung out. I missed the fishing. I missed just hanging out on his on the tailgate of the back of the truck, and just shooting shit about stories. And I miss all that, man. I mean, he was a good dude. He was so cool. He used to come to the house, sit on the deck, watch Phillies with me, him yeah. and Graham and Pop. Yeah. He was, yeah, he was a good dude, man. I miss him. What's it like being Stevie Banana's daughter? <laughs> what would your daughter say? I think my daughters are proud of me, considering where we started. I think they, they also think that I go from zero to 100 really, really quick. And I'm a very aggressive talker, they said. Uh, I am an aggressive person. If, if, uh, I'm a seize the moment guy. If, if I have some, I'm very strong. I'm a Leo. I'm, I have a very strong opinion about everything. If I see something, I'm going to say something, you know, and I'm not going to back down from it. If, if I believe that I'm right, I, I will argue till I drop dead. What's it like being uh, your mother? What would mom say about you, Debbie? Little Deb. Yeah. You still, you still owe that Debbie story. Just don't forget. It's coming. Um, I think my mom's proud of me, but she doesn't want to tell me uh, because she hasn't told me. Yeah. And if she did, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. Um, I think she's proud of both her children, Jamie and I, you know, cause we are good kids. We're, we're not bad kids. We both love her very much. I respect my mom because, you know, she raised me and Jamie pretty much alone. She worked really, really hard her whole life and she never remarried. She's, you know, been involved in a couple of relationships, but they didn't work out, you know? Yeah. She's never really had anybody, like, take her on extravagant vacation. She's never spent uh, a lot of time with anyone, as far as years, I mean, with another man or whatnot. She doesn't have a man that, that'll just say, hey, let's go to dinner, you know, or on a Friday or Saturday night or whatever. She doesn't have that, you know? And she's, you know, she's, she's going to be 65 in a couple of days. And, you know, we recently had an argument, and um, I haven't spoken to her since, and I, I think... I just might go over her house after this. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> and, what you're going to do. And reach out, you know, like, because I know she's stubborn. She, she said some mean stuff too. I know she don't mean it, but she, she won't reach out first. Right. It's okay. So it's, it's my job as being the son to just go and, Hey, just blow it over. Let it yeah. go. It's not worth it. It isn't worth it. It's, it's not worth it. And it, that moment just hit me just now. Good. Good. I'm fucking saving relationships here. One podcast at a time. <laughs> so i mean your mother loves you brother you you know that i do i know that she you know that she apparently has a hard time you know, expressing herself um but she does she had a rough childhood yeah yeah how about being your dad what's it like being your dad oh my dad my dad and i relationship got better as i got older definitely i had the opportunity to play ball with him on the same team in a men's league, which was awesome because yeah. most people can't say that. Yeah. And that was fun. I mean, we had, we butted heads at times, but it was fun. But looking back on it, I had a blast and I wish it was more than one year, but it wasn't. My dad would say that he's very proud of me and he does tell me often. He said, you did not, he did not think I would be where I am today. He's proud of Jamie too. He's proud of all his kids. Yeah. He lives in Florida now. So he's, Always calling me, you know, once a month. And if I don't call him, if I don't talk to him once a month, he's, he gets a little annoyed. He doesn't like texting. He wants me to, he wants to hear my voice. So That's I call him. And uh, I go down, since he's been down in Florida, I go down during spring training and I always take him to a Phillies game. So, you know, we hang out a lot when we're down there. What's it like being your boss? Uh, John, John is, John is super proud of me. So he calls me his son because John also does not have any sons. He has two girls. He said, it's a shame that we didn't meet 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with him 14 years now. Yeah. I didn't realize it's been that long. Yeah. It was 13 years. I'm sorry. 13 so years. It's, it was 13 years ago. You, you quit that other job where you were miserable at. Yeah. Jesus Christ. 
This is my 30th year down the market. Wow. It's crazy. I mean, if, you know, I mean, maybe you were just fucking miserable last year. I don't know. I mean, I feel, I feel like it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> I think I've gotten a lot better. No, you, I'm only kidding. But anything else? Any crazy stories you want to tell me about your little life? As I told Motown Mike, I called it his little life. Or Motown Mike. Shout out to Michael. It's Motown, by the way. Ah, stop. It's catching on. on. It's It's catching catching on. on. I'm sure he loves that. Stevie Bananas. (laughs) Before I get into the 20 questions, I'm going to tell my Debbie story. My (laughs) my Debbie Bananas story. Steve and I hadn't seen each other for a while. He had been going through a tough time with with the twins. They had just been born. Maybe they were a couple years old. We start hanging out together. I guess we were, you were 28. I was 27. I know that because the league that we played in was a 28 and over league. I start hanging out with you again the year before. And I couldn't play, but I was practicing with the team and hanging out, going to play basketball up in the Northeast Philly. And we were out one time. His mother had the kids, the three girls. We were at the bar too long. This would happen. That's absolutely what happened. Um, and we, we come back around and we get up the street. I go to say hi to Debbie. I hadn't seen Debbie in 20 years. I mean, it had to be fucking 20 years. Yeah, it was It was 15. It was close. Yeah, it was a long time. It was, it was over a decade. She, she starts screaming at me right away. God damn it, David, you're making him late. I don't even know what the fuck she said. That absolutely happened. I don't even know what she said. She, scre- she screamed at David like like she saw him yesterday. Like And like I was still 15 years old. That's, that's true. And I was that's, 27. So it's your fault. He's late. It's my fucking Where did you have him? Yeah. It's never my fault, buddy. I'm her son. It's my fault. Jesus Christ. I said, so I looked at Steve and I said, hi, Deb. Good to see you. He said, I'm not doing that again. That was great. All right. Times. Uh, she's great, though. De- Debbie's always nice to me, except for every once in a while when I get yelled at. All right. You ready for these 20 questions? Yes. All right. What makes you angry? It's the Angry Day podcast. Everybody has to answer what they what makes them angry. Almost everything. <laughs> Explain. No, what, what what makes me really angry? Yeah, when people don't do their job, and there's no repercussions. Right, like just do your job. Just do your job. No one cares if you don't feel good, or no one cares if you don't have the right shirt on, or no one cares if your belly aches. Just do your job. Just do your job. Yeah, or stay home. Or stay home. Yeah, I hear you. What makes you happy? My family and friends, especially my my. I know. It's kind of hard to believe, but yeah, my, my, my girls make me happy. Just knowing that they're okay, I'm happy. I don't know if it's that hard to believe. That's, that's all that matters to me. Good. What makes you most proud? What makes me most proud is where I am today as opposed to where I started off. Because I had zero direction in life. Yeah. Zero. And I'm, I am where I am. I never got into any drugs, never did anything like that. Never got arrested in my adult life. One time. One time child. One time child life. No, for me, it was three. You got arrested three times? Yeah. When I was a kid. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. (laughs) Wait, where was the other two times? So one time we were walking out of a convenience store. The other time was Sheridan and Shunk playing slap ball. It was like a sting operation, man. We got arrested by the feds. They I just got caught up in the wrong situation. Uh, they thought you were like in drugs or whatever? Yeah. Did yeah. they just release you right away? They released me about two hours later. And then what was the third time? The third time was in high school when I was hanging around a 10th tasker. Oh, yeah, just like another hanging, sting a, a sting operation. Like hanging on a corner or whatever? Well, apparently I don't know where the drug spots are because I'm <laughs> not smart enough. But they thought I was a drug kingpin, which was hysterical because I was poor. Yeah. <laughs> I could attest. But again, got, you know, let go right away. Yeah. Figured, oh, wait a minute, he's the wrong kid. Jesus Christ, man. It was a juvenile, dude. Um, Stop fucking hanging on fucking <laughs> convenience store corners. <laughs> That's how you. That's what you did in South Philly. It is what you did. And we're play sports. Maybe well, some, you're not playing sports at nine o'clock at night. Maybe we'll someday talk about the art of 
finding somebody to get you a 40. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, the, the place on 8th and Morris, the little Chinese restaurant. I had a fake temple ID, and they gave me 40s anytime I wanted. And I used to get beer for everybody. Yeah. And never got busted. Never. Yeah. I used to go to the, the local bum, who I will name nameless, and fucking give him a couple extra bucks. We would buy him a 40, and then he would get us like three 40s or whatever. Yeah. What is most important to you? Happiness. I have to be happy no matter what. When are you happy? I'm happy when my family's together, all of them, including my, my sister, Frankie, the boys, my niece, all of them. I wish that I can have everybody together at least once a year, but that's hard to do. When I say everybody, I mean, you know, my father too. It's hard to do because life gets in the way. Yeah. Everybody has stuff to do. It's, you know, and I know it's a lame excuse and it's, it is, it, it is a lame excuse. It really is. But you, you know, people get busy man, and they don't intend to do it intentionally. It's just, that's why I make it an effort every Sunday to go over my sisters, even by myself, just to spend time with the, the boys and my niece. And that's my sister saying, she's like, you don't come over here for me. You come over here for the, the kids. I said, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I miss them. Even just to sit for an hour and talk. Right. Yeah, just the presence. People don't do that anymore. You know, it's hard with friends, with family. It's all hard because, yes, life does get in the way. But I, I agree with that sentiment. You have to make time and you have to make the effort. You have to put it on a schedule. It's the same thing with relationships, right? Things aren't going to just naturally stay vibrant, right? right. You have to work at it. Yeah, yeah. This, this angry fella told me that one. <laughs> don't be distant from your friends. And it kind of sunk in a little bit. I mean, you, you go to work every day, you, you get tied up in crap, and you realize, oh man, three months went by. Yeah. You know? It's easy, man. It's easy for it to happen. It's not on purpose. Um, it's easy for it to happen because best friends then become just good friends, and then over time, and then it's just friends, and then they become acquaintances, and, and then you're, you know, you're a memory because you haven't put any effort into it. It's easy for it to happen. That won't happen to us, buddy. Um, I mean, I'm hoping it will. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Woo. All right. Next question. Tell me about a time you shit yourself. Oh, boy. It's funny you said this because I was listening to uh, Motel Met Mike tell his story, which was funny. Mine was a little different. I was coming home from umpiring. As you know, I umpired for years. And I got stuck on 76. Bad accident. Like to where they shut it down. Car was on fire. There was a fatality. When that happens, they shut, they shut it down. And you don't know how long you're going to be there. Now, this was on the way back. So it was probably around 7 p.m. at night. I just, don't, just got done doing a high school game. And man, I had to go. <laughs> and it was bad. Unfortunately for me, I had cloth seats. Okay? Cloth seats. Not a good thing for not shitting. Not a good thing. So you're sitting there and I'm fidgeting around. Because I'm trying to hold it in as much as I can. And it just came out. Like, like just came out. Like, the, there was no clinching, nothing, anything. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do anything because I'm in the middle lane, stuck in traffic. Mm -hmm. So I can't pull over. Mm -hmm. So I did open the door. And the lady next to me looked at me like, oh my God, what's he doing? Is he going to carjack me? <laughs> but I had paper towel in my back seat because I always carry that just in case. Mm -hmm. And I rolled up paper towel and literally wiped my ass in the middle of a highway. <laughs> you put your bare ass out? Well, no, I stuck my hand down there and did, but everybody saw what I was doing. The car behind me cocked the horn, went out the window. He said, that's the greatest thing I ever seen in my life. <laughs> did you get shit on your hand? Oh, of course I did. But I did have a bottle of water handy, so I washed my hands and this and that. But it still stunk bad. And I had the windows down because it was in May. Yeah. So it was warm out. And then all the cars around me, the one guy applauded. It was it was funny. Did you you lose your you lost your underwear? Uh yeah, absolutely. Did you lose your pants? Uh, I did not. No. no. I wasn't in uniform. I know I don't I used to get changed when we would leave, just in case something like that happened. You got it fast enough not to lose. I did, yes. I act I acted swiftly. I had to. How about the how about the cloth seats that they Thank God nothing happened and I did put paper towel down on them. For the ride home. And guess what? We were stuck there another hour. What did the lady do? Did she 
she wouldn't look at me. She wouldn't look at me the whole time. I kind of like honked over to say, "Hey," and wave my hand. She wouldn't even look over, yeah. and she che- she kept inching up. Oh my god! It was it was it was hysterical. You got a fucking applause. I got an applause from the guy behind me. Told me it was the greatest thing he's ever seen. <laughs> Tell us about an embarrassing fart or pee story. Okay, it was uh, not that long ago, and you were with me, mm-hmm. so we were visiting a friend. In Cincinnati, we went to the Eagles Bengals game. I believe it was Carson Wentz's first year, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I let one out in the car. He was driving. You were behind, sitting in the back seat. It was not pleasant. <laughs> and you got, and you were gagging. I thought you were going to throw up. I mean, oh man, it was fun. It was bad. It was those Guinness farts, man. Dude, they're bad. I just recalled, by the way, I forgot, totally forgot about this. But you used to fucking fart on cue as, as when we were teenagers. Yep. Like, you would fart everywhere. On cue, yep. It was fucking ridiculous. That was part of going to an all-boys high school, because if you went, if you actually went to where there was females, that wouldn't happen. But you would fucking fart all the time. Especially when we were in our friends, yeah. yeah. My, my daughters want to buy me a shirt that says, I love to fart. Jesus Christ, you were ridiculous. They were all, like, they were very tight farts at the time. I'm sure they're not less tight now. With your, you know, the things that you've done. <laughs> I'm just we talk way too much about gas, dude. But they were like, you know, like fucking mouse on a motorcycle farts. You know what I mean? Yeah. All the fucking time. Yeah, dude. yeah. Jesus Christ, I hated that about you. What's the most unreasonable thing about you? Ah, uh, my aggression. My daughters say you go from zero to one hundred, and you you don't even think before you speak. Sometimes. There's no speed bump from my brain to my mouth. Yeah. You know what I mean? And all I got to do, I'm trying, I'm working on that. I'm getting better at it. Let's put it that way. But yeah, it's just some things like you speak words and you can literally grab them and put them back in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Because I can be, uh, I can be mean. I can be rude. I can be a sweetheart. I can be a total jit bag. <laughs> jit bag. Yeah. I love the jit bag. That's a, that's a my Uncle John term. Uncle Johnny, yeah. I remember Uncle Johnny. He used to beat the shit out of me, too. Yeah. Lots of lots of beatings. Lots of fucking chicken wings and full Nelsons. Lots of them. All right. Have you ever caught your parents or, you know, older person having sex? Or have you ever been caught having sex? I've never caught my parents having sex because they were divorced when I was four. Yeah, well, I'm... So. Yeah. Um, no, neither one of them. No, never. Um, no, nope. Oh, I know. I don't think. I don't think my mom had sex after we were born. <laughs> That's a joke. I've been caught. Yeah. Oh, all right. Jessica caught us <laughs> when she was little. It was traumatizing. What did you tell her you were doing? You just say we didn't sound- talk about it. We 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 just never discussed it. Yeah. And my mom caught me, not in the act, but she caught me right after. I mean, where were you? In your, your we, we were in her bedroom. That's why she caught me. Oh, Jesus Christ. Dude. Yeah. She flipped out. Yeah, I bet. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, you know, the, the sex juice. That's what she called it. <laughs> the sex juice. What did you, she said, I know you were having sex. I can see and smell the sex juice. <laughs> ah. I'm like, okay. All right. I need, I need, I need the story. That's the, I need the story in my life. So you're having sex with your girlfriend mm-hmm. at the time. I will not say who it was. Yeah, no, no. Not important to the detail. But she was the hottest girl ever. She, she had a third. She was good. Yeah, she was. I don't know. She I'm was thinking, awesome. It's important that she's super sexy. Anyway, so you get done. Were you dressed already? Yeah, dressed coming down the steps, and she was coming in. Oh, she was. So coming. she caught us coming down the steps. Oh. So she said, were still, "What were you doing? Were you still a little sweaty? A little, a little bit, yeah, yeah." And I said, "I was helping her in the bathroom." Stupid me. That was a dumb answer. <laughs> She said, my mom said, helping her do what? <laughs> and, you know, me being a smart ass, say, pull her panties up. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, I was a smart ass. How old were you? 17. Right. Senior year. Yeah. And then, and then, and she said, she said to the girl, you, you have to go home right now. Yeah. And she said she understood. And then and my mom said, nope, you stay right here. Cause I was going to walk her home. She yeah. said, no, 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 you stay here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, why? She goes, well, I want to know what you did. I said, Mom, you know what we did. And then and she, she go- went upstairs and she said, no, you did. She didn't believe me at first. 
She said, yeah, she thought I was kidding because she knows how I always used to mess around with her and joke right. around. Right. And she went up and that's when she, you know, said, I can s- smell and see the sex juice. And my, she freaked out more. I think, I don't think she was mad because she caught me having sex. I think she was mad because I did it in her bedroom. Well, that's a fucking fair point, dude. I mean, yeah, I know. But my bed sucked. It was terrible. And it just happened. Oh, it just happened. Yeah. Well, I mean, I went in my, my mother's bedroom for something. I don't remember exactly what it was, but yeah. came in the bedroom. The girl came in the bedroom and, uh, you know, kind of jumped my bones and it happened. It just happened. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like when you happened. just plop one in the gym. It just, just happened. It just happened. What celebrity can play you in a movie? Why? That's a weird question. I know. Well, when I was younger, I had a couple people tell me I looked like Brian Austin Green from 90210. <laughs> so, there, so, there, so there you go. You have him play something as being an aggressive father of girls who plays in a men's baseball league <laughs> uh, and, and umpires every now and then. That sounds kind of boring. What is something that you used to think was true and then turned out to be ridiculous? Anything? Oh, yeah. My mother used to say to me all the time, put a hat on, you're going to get sick because it's cold out. <laughs> That's such a crock of shit for all you people out there. You don't get sick from the cold. You get sick from germs. The cold actually reduces your immune system, and that is why, and if you catch germs, that's why you get sick. You can go out in the cold with shorts on. It doesn't matter. Would you agree with that, Dave? I, I, I agree. I agree with your assessment. Uh-huh. And that's just the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. But I used to believe it when I was a kid. Yeah, well, there's a lot of that stuff, right? Or don't go swimming after you eat. You have to wait an hour. Oh, Another yeah, crock man. of shit. Yeah, what was that about? That was I, just... I, don't, I don't know. I, had, I have no idea. And, and then when you asked them for an explanation, because I said so. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a great that's, explanation. That's the way we do things. Yeah. What's an everyday struggle for you? It really isn't a struggle for me every day because I think considering where I am in my life, uh, I have made good decisions. I guess trying to be the best parent, the best husband I could be. I, I guess I'm doing okay because I'm still married. And, How about like minor struggles? I don't know. You know, like my... Biting my nails. Biting your nails. That's been a struggle my entire life. What is that about? Why do you do that? Just nervousness? That's what they say, I guess. I don't know, but sometimes I bite them when I'm not nervous. Yeah. Weird. I've been getting better. Like they're, they look better now than they've ever did in my life. But according to normal people, they do not look good. I mean, you do... It's, cold environment all day. Yeah, that's tough. That's a struggle too. That's a struggle. I'm uh, in the past five years or so. I'm starting to notice. You know, I'm having a lot of problems with my uh, feet and hands, and that's arthritis. Yeah, what's it's getting the, bad? What's the what's the temperature in that place all day long? Well, they say it's 55. Yeah. I I say that's bullshit because it feels like it's 45, 50, yeah. Yeah. and especially in the winter time, it'll drop down to 40. It's not really cold to a lot of people, but when you work eight, ten hours in it, it's cold. Yeah, right. Consistent chill. Yes. If you were arrested today, what would your friends and family think happened? That I in a fight, beat the shit out of somebody for my aggression. Maybe you got the shit beat out of you, dude. What? You're an old man now. You're fucking still tough. You're still a tough guy. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea, dude. Somebody might, like, Kick me in the knee or the ankle, I'll go down. <laughs> I haven't been in a fight since I was a kid. Yeah. I, I think me and you have a similar story to Mikey, uh, Motown Mike, is that we threw each other around once, right? Did we? Yeah, remember? I think we were in, like, Bell Schoolyard. I don't remember. We were, like, fighting over stickball or some shit. We just threw each other remember. around for, like, 30 seconds and then stopped. Yeah, I could never hit you. Uh, Probably what we would do. if I hit you, man, you're gonna you're gonna go down. I wanna go down. Yeah, but that's yes, that's sir. where I'll lose. Yes. When you go down, you'll probably bite my ankles. Uh Motown White tried that one time. <laughs> uh, we were drunk. It might have been during the pandemic. And I yeah. I might have like still been training a lot. And he's like, uh, eh, you know, you and a stupid judo. Well, I don't think it's stupid. You and a stupid judo, you fucking think you're tough. And then he wanted to fight. And he yeah, I might have hurt his shoulder. I love you, Mike. Mike, I love you too, Mike. Sorry for shoulder hurting. Pretty strong for your size. Oh, that's, that's another short joke. All right, next question. If you were a woman for one day, what would you do? Oh, boy. 
What do what? you think? I don't know. You tell me. That's Come on. What would let's you stay indoors and let's leave it at that. You would touch yourself? Of course. And try everything. <laughs> uh, are you good at keeping secrets? Next question. I like to think so. You're fucking a liar. Go ahead. No, that's not true. I mean, I... I well, important ones, yeah. Okay. Important Things ones. that don't matter. Who cares? <laughs> uh, we, Why, what are you referring to? I don't know. We used to, we used to have a joke on the baseball team. If you, want, if you want everybody to know something, just tell Steve it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was stupid shit, though. <laughs> Dumb shit. Uh... Have you ever practiced kissing in front of the mirror? No. Ever like on your hand? No. Never? No, it's weird. No, not even when you were a kid? Unless to God. All right. Weird. I used to practice on the girls that I used to. Oh, yes. <laughs> Don Juan. Oh, I'm sure. I never, I never had a problem. It sounds really arrogant, and I know it sounds terrible, but, but to be honest, there may have been one or two girls that said no. Yeah. That's it. Maybe that's why I was so arrogant as a kid. Maybe. I'm sure that contributed to it, which didn't help. I mean, Because you need to be humble. I mean, when you go and pick your girls at the blind school, that happens. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what it was. Uh, next question. Oh, well, just because there's no answer to that question, I'm changing it. Did you ever pick your nose and eat it? No. Never? No. <laughs> Sorry. I, I pick my nose, yeah. Yeah. No, I always used to wipe it, though. What's your favorite place to pick your nose? In your car? Maybe. I don't know. How often do you pick your nose? Not often. You know, I've, you know I picked my nose the first time when I was like 32 years old. Really? Yeah. That is very interesting. I have a, I have a story about my aunt and her picking my nose when I was a little kid, and it traumatized me, and I wouldn't even touch my nose. You do know that about me, about the nose thing that I got. Like, you can't yes. really fuck with my nose. Yes. I freak the fuck out. I'm get, I've am i gotten better. But. You, well, you just told everyone your weakness, so now we know how to beat you. <laughs> weakness. Uh, no, my weakness is I'm fucking fat and old. Well, that doesn't help either. Next question. What annoys you most about me? You? Yes, me. Tell them the truth, motherfucker. Let's go. I'll, I'll tell the truth. You can be a little arrogant sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's really about it. I mean, and I'm opinionated, and I tell you. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's. Yeah, but I do the same thing though. Um, lack of emotion. Any? Nah, that don't really bother me because I know that's who you are. So that doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of people in my family like that. Yeah, it's not a lack of emotion. It's 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 the it's here. Here it is. When you walk in a room, you always think you're the smartest guy in the room. Ah. And it's not always the case. Especially if the room's full of 100 people. You don't know. <laughs> What's the matter? You're, you're, you're blushing. I'm just listening, buddy. It's good. I can take it. Uh, most embarrassing drunk story. You have one of those? You know what's funny? I heard this question previous couple episodes, and, uh, and I started thinking about it. I'm going to say one of them was... Our friend John, who got married, yeah, went to his bachelor party, yeah, and at the horse track originally. But then we went on to other, other places, yeah. We we were on the school bus, yeah. If you remember correctly, we we brought our buddy Charlie was with us, yeah, and Jimmy, yeah. Shout out to those guys, uh, Chuck. Yep, uh, we had a blast. It was probably one of the best bachelor parties I've ever had. There you go, Johnny. You know who scheduled that bachelor party, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, of course. See, there's but, the arrogance. Arrogance. So, got pretty dinged up, man. You drink all day, and then you do shots, and then you drink bourbon. And you're, you're pretty banged up. So, we get home. Charlie drove us home, by the way, because he was worried. He was genuinely worried about me and Jimmy. He was cute. Charlie's cute. And, uh, yeah, I used the word cute. For Chuck. And um, I get home, and my wife asks me if I'm okay. And I told her, shut the fuck up and get in the fucking house. Jesus. So she locked me out, and then I blew chunks on the front lawn. And, and what was embarrassing about that, because I'm sure everybody's thrown up, is that my wife made me pick it up the following morning. And yes, I picked up chunky puke in the front lawn. Did you sleep on the front lawn? 
No, she eventually let me in, but she made me sleep downstairs. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, and she said, "Do you remember that?" And I said, "I don't remember anything." And I said to her that I'm sorry, and she goes, "Well, it happened." Now here's a plastic bag. Go pick up your throw up. And I said, "How the fuck do you pick up throw up?" And she goes, "Oh, you'll see." And it was everything I ate the day before, uh, and it was wow. Shout out to Jen for not taking your shit. Yeah, right. It's a good one. I thought I remembered that one. What profession would you have liked to do if you weren't slinging produce? Sports journalism. Anything to do with sports. Tell me about that. I would love to be on the sideline, interviewing players, all that. I know a lot of people are involved in it. You have to, you have to slum it for a while. Yeah. There may not be that much money in in it, but you know if 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 you get lucky, you could. But for me, it wasn't the money. It would be the experience, being around football, baseball, basketball, whatever it was. Yeah, you know that, that would be cool. I think. And we, I have a friend from high school that is involved in that now. Shout out to Robbie. He's the Pirates color analyst. Awesome. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. And we go we we go out there to see him once in a while. Nice. All right. Last two questions. If God exists and you reach the pearly gates, what would you like God to say to you? What would I like him to say or what's he going to say? Well, what, do you, what would you like him to say? And then what do you think he'll say? Well, <laughs> what I would like him to say is welcome. I'm glad you made it. Yeah. What he's really going to say, the hell are you doing here? <laughs> I'm surprised you made it. Uh, all right. When it's all over, what do you want all of us to remember you as? What do you want us to remember about you? You mean when I die? Um, I mean when you're fucking dead. Yeah. yeah. And I was a good man. I just want to be a good person. And I don't really have a legacy. So, I mean. What do you mean you don't have a legacy? Well, talk to me about that. Oh, well, I mean, I haven't done anything exciting in life. You know what I mean? Like, you know, as long as my children, my wife, especially my parents, yeah. as long as they're proud of me. That's all I want. I, I just. I want them to be proud of me. Well, why don't you think you have a legacy? Like you have three kids that you raised that are good people, that are that are doing better than you are doing. You that's, think that's a legacy? That is exactly the only legacy that matters. Yeah, I guess, but that's not you know. It's okay. What, what, why? Because why? seven, at, eight out of ten people raise a family that's better than them. No, I don't. So know. I'm not doing anything special. I I don't know about that, man. I, I don't know about. Uh, making the world a little bit better of a place that everybody's doing that. Nobody gets remembered. Nobody knows what, who the seventh president was. Right. 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 So, you know, all those special accolades, but that, that doesn't matter. It, it matters. It, relationships matter. You know, if you want to have a legacy, you can have that legacy. That's all that matters is what you're putting out into the world. So, yeah, don't, I, guess, don't, I guess so. Yeah. Don't underestimate your value to this world and to your family. Uh, oh, I thank you, David. Well, that's part of what this podcast is about, man. Yeah, about I thank you for having me. It's pretty cool. I enjoy it. I enjoyed the previous episodes. I'm looking forward to more. Yeah. I mean, and I get the little goof on you a little bit, which, was, which was fun. That's fine. It's funny because my nephews are, you know, well, my one nephew, he's and he's going to be 16 and, and he's, he's starting to get the jokes. Yeah. And he's chiming in. Yeah. And he's always, you know, he's busting on me and he's busting on his dad. And, That's fun. And, and, and I think it's great. Yeah. And then Frankie and I, you know, on Sundays, he's like, can you believe this kid? I was like, yeah, I love it. I love." He goes, don't you think he's being a smart ass? I said, yeah, I love it. I yeah. said, That's the best part about it. I yeah. said, That's, this is what counts right here. Yeah. 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 You got to give, you got to give him room to be a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Give him room to grow. I love it. Oh, my kids make fun of me. They team up on me now. It's oh, man. Jessica, she's witty, boy. He comes out with some quips, and I'm like, "Oh, wow! She's so she's so smart. <laughs> she's uh, yeah, she makes us laugh all the time. She's very funny. So is Jen. They're both very funny. Yeah, your wife is uh, funny. They make me laugh all the time, and that's important. I think uh -oh. laughter is the key to success. I'm going to tell one more story. Oh boy! And then we're going to be done with this. There was one time we were playing poker at your house. I knew this was going to come up. Oh, I forgot about it until right now. <laughs> We were playing poker at your house, and we were talking about some movie. And I think you said something like, oh, I didn't, I don't remember that movie. She said, no, you, Steve, you wouldn't have watched the movie. You wouldn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody 
and died. And she by, like, by the movie, there was uh, the jacket the with jacket. Uh, Adrian Brody. But that's not the story I was thinking of. I would the say. story I was thinking of was we were all playing poker. Yeah. And she said, why don't we order some pizzas? Yeah. And I said, okay, why don't you get one pizza with half sauces, half <laughs> cheese, and the other pizza with half pepperoni, half cheese? And she looked at me and said, what? Why don't you just get a pepperoni and a sausage? <laughs> and everybody was, it paused real quiet in silence, and then they all just laughed. Oh, uh, fantastic. Yeah, uh, she, she likes to do those moments at times. Uh, they're funny. Yeah, they're funny. And she laughs at my jokes, and that's really what's important. That's the most important. Yes. Yeah. There's something about that ego thing I think you might have been talking about earlier. All right. You got anything else? No, man. Thanks for having me, buddy. I love you. I love you too, man. I love you too. And it's good to see you. I miss you. Miss you too. All right. Until next time, this is the Angry Day Podcast, and I'm out. Peace.